everybody. Um, welcome to the uh, session four of this year's LIBA conference. Um, and session four is uh, on the theme of open access, a case for diversity and inclusion. So um, thanks for joining. I'm Martin Moyle. I'm Director of Services in the Library at UCL, University College London. Um, we have had a few technical issues this morning, so I apologise for the late start and also for the fact that uh, you can't see me, which must be um, a, a matter of a great disappointment to you. We are hoping to fix the video stream as we go, uh, but it won't affect the presentations. So just a few housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we have three talks today in this session and I'll be introducing the speakers shortly. There will be the opportunity to ask questions, plenty of opportunity in fact, but the format today is that we'll have a full Q&A session with all the speakers um, at the end of the session. Excuse me a moment, uh, we are now video enabled, so perhaps you can see me as well as hear me. Um, if you want to ask a question, post it in the chat any time in the course of the session, post a question in the chat and we'll pick them up at the end. And if it's a question for a particular uh, presenter, please just uh, please say so. And finally, the session is being recorded. So you will get copies of the recording and the slides um, sometime after the session finishes. So excuse me a moment. Um, this is what we have in store today. Um, this is the second year running that the LIBA conference has been conducted online. We all know why, um, fingers crossed for next year. And of course, if there are any more technical glitches, uh, I think we've had them all probably by now, but if there are any, then do please be patient and we'll do what we can to sort them out as um, fast as we can. So, okay, let's get started. I'm gonna introduce our first speakers uh, briefly. Uh, I'll be turning the screen over to Timon Erfelein and Henk van den Hoogen. But just before I do that, I'd like to add the happy news that um, Timon and Henk's paper has been um, awarded one of the Lieber Innovation Awards for 2021. Um, so congratulations uh, to both our speakers and uh, Timon, I, <laughs> yes, <laughs> well deserved, I'm sure. So um, I'm going to turn the screen over uh, to you two. I think it's Timon up first, but I will just quietly disappear. So over to you, please. Thank you. Okay. Okay, can you see my presentation okay, Martin? It's perfect. Uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I was on mute. Uh, uh, yes, I can see it perfectly. Please carry on, thanks. Great, thank you very much, Martin. Um, my name is Timon Oferlein. I've been with Springer Nature for nearly 20 years and I'm looking after our Scandinavian and Benelux customers. Um, thank you, Martin, for introducing the session. Um, and first, I'd like to thank uh, myself. I'd like to myself and also my, on behalf of my co-presenter, we'd like to thank Lieber for allowing us to present to you today. And we'd also like to thank Lieb and OCRC for awarding our abstract one of the three Library Innovation Awards. The prize money will go to an SDG related project at a Dutch university. So without further ado, I will jump straight into it. The project started in early 2019, following the renewal of the read and publish agreement that Springer Nature has with the Netherlands there. At the time, both parties agreed that more research needs to be undertaken on the wider societal impact of open access publishing, especially as it relates to non-academic actors. And so in order to address this knowledge gap, we had jointly decided to set up a collaborative project group. The group consisted of representatives from three organizations. First, the Association of Universities in the Netherlands, or VSNU for short. Second, the UKB consortium, consisting of 13 universities and the Royal Library of the Netherlands. And finally, Springer Nature. The first thing we did as a team was to finalize the main research questions. And here we agreed on three main questions with each one being addressed by a special subgroup or work stream as we called it we decided to interlink the first two subgroups. So work stream number one addressed the question, what is the societal impact of scholarly publication 
and how can we best capture it? Workstream number two focused on the question, how do open access formats perform when compared to non-OA formats? And further, what is the impact on the non-academic sector? And thirdly, the workstream number three ran parallel to the first two and addressed the question of what tools can we recommend to researchers to maximize the societal impact of research? Another key decision we made early on was that all project outputs would be openly published on the repository Zenodo. In the end, we actually published over 40 outputs, including white papers, dashboards, infographics, workshop outputs, blog posts, etc. All of the work is openly accessible under a CC by license. For each of the work streams, we installed an interdisciplinary team along with a project leader. And here are all the names of key participants. Further, an additional management team coordinated the overall running of the project meeting monthly for about a year and a half. In total, some 30 to 40 people were involved with the bulk of work spread across six organizations. These are VSNU, UKB, Maastricht University, Freie University Amsterdam, Springer Nature, and Digital Science as our contracted technology partner. I coordinated work stream number one, and when I give you an overview of what we did in this project group, I'll also cover half of uh, the work of project uh, work stream number two. After that, Hank will take you through the rest of work stream two, as well as work stream three. And each one of us will also provide you with some key takeaways and lessons learned. So the first task of this work stream was to define what is the societal impact of research. We discussed many proxies or potential proxies of impact, but eventually settled on a broad definition based on research relevancy to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This allowed us to focus on the most urgent societal challenges. Further, we expanded our definition to include usage data, odd metric data, and qualitative survey data. In this work stream, the main challenge was building an SDG classifier. And so in order to achieve this, we teamed up with our technology partner, Digital Science. We started with the five goals as a proof of concept. These were SDG three, good health and well-being, SDG four, quality education, SDG seven, affordable and clean energy, SDG 11, sustainable cities and community, and SDG 16, peace, justice, and strong institutions. For each goal, we created a keyword-based search based on the UN's targets and indicators for each respective goal. Our search strategy was conservative and favored precision over recall. In other words, we gave top priority to minimizing false positives, even if that meant accepting a couple or some false negatives. We then generated a training set from the machine learning before conducting further quality assurance um, checks via our editors, internal editors, as well as several Dutch academics. And finally, we classified all academic content published between 2010 and 2019 and affiliated to Dutch-based authors. In total, we classified some 600,000 items with 40,000 positive SDG hits. Around 75% of the classified content was for journals, the rest for books. We then mashed up all the data in a rapid prototype dashboard to see what difference the open access format makes. Later in our second dashboard, we added counter usage stats and expanded the SDG analysis across all 17 SDGs, all publishers and all countries. This screenshot shows the first prototype dashboard we created based on the five SDG goals, three, four, seven, 11 and 16 and also openly available via project web page. It was coded by the research intelligence team at the Freie University Amsterdam, and our huge thanks go to Maud van der Feesten there. At the time, it was a brilliant quick win and gave us some great initial insights into the data. The interactive dashboard allows for filtering by goal, by university, by subject group, by content format, and gives initial answers to some fairly specific questions. The two goals with the highest volume of articles were for SDG 3, good health, and SDG 7, affordable energy. On the other hand, quality education and sustainable cities had the least article counts. These results were in line with the overall European trend. The dashboard also confirmed that there seems to be no correlation between the average metric performance of SDG content and the average field weighted citation performance. This was particularly evident for the goal of peace and justice which scored quite high on the altmetric side, but lower on the citation side. 
And further, sustainable cities perform strongly on the academic size, side, while it's lower on the odd metric side. Another interesting insight was the very high number of overall policy mentions for SDG articles, which was great to see. In addition to this prototype dashboard, we also released two additional dashboards covering all 17 SDGs, which we then used for all our analytical and reporting work. The first featuring NAL data and the second featuring global data. Both contain up to 30 additional filters. Here is a screenshot of the free SDG dashboard featuring the global data. And you can also visit our webpage, our project webpage, which links out to it. The completion of the SDG classifier, along with the prototype dashboard, triggered Workstream 2, which then focused on four main tasks. First, creating the final dashboard covering all 17 SDGs. Second, analyzing all data points, including regression analysis of the usage and optometric data. And third, conducting additionally additional qualitative survey work. And fourth, publishing all results in a white paper downloadable from Zenodo. Whilst the initial analysis focused on the, on the Netherlands, I'd like to share today a few data points from the global SDG publication data. This slide shows the number of SDG relevant documents published between 2015 and 19 across all goals, all countries, all publishers here expressed as a percentage. In total, our algorithm had assessed some 20 million items published during this time frame, from which 1.9 million or around 8% were classified as SDG relevant. As you can see, around three quarters of all classified items were characterized into just four goals, namely energy, health, education, and peace and justice. Goals with a particularly low count include no poverty, zero hunger, life below water, and gender equality. Overall, around 93% of all items were classified into just one goal, and the remaining 7% into multiple goals. We're looking at SDG content by publication format, so OA versus non-OA, a fairly similar picture emerges for nearly all goals. For most goals, around 50% of the classified content is for open access and, the, and another 50% for non-OA. On the OA side, around 70% of items are for gold, another 10% for hybrid, and further 20% for bronze and 8% for green. Perhaps affordable and clean energy sticks out with nearly 70% of content being non-OA and only 16% for gold and hybrid together. This slide shows the results for usage and optometric performance of classified SDG content. The results are categorized by OA status. Let's start with the usage. I'll see the top part of this slide. Here, the results are based on a smaller subset of Spring and Nature articles published in the year 2017. So for this poll of some 36,000 articles, we extracted counter for usage statistics. The key takeaway is that the counter usage is substantially higher for open access SDG content than for non-open access SDG content. Hybrid OA is downloaded most, getting on average around four times as many downloads when compared to subscription content. In fact, our regression model predicts that over 400 more downloads for hybrid articles. The lower part of the slide contains results for the old metric attention analysis. Here we looked at items from all publishers, so some 358,000 articles. Perhaps not surprisingly, again, hybrid performed best, receiving significantly more old metric attention than subscription content. A model predicted a 243% higher old metric score for hybrid. Just a few additional points. For our regression analysis, we used the negative binomial model and corrected for multiple variables, including for document, author, and journal, so at three different levels. And second, we've recently done further research to show that usage and optometric performance is significantly higher for SDG content than for non-SDG content. And now to some key takeaways for Workstream number one and the analytical part of work stream number two. Overall, the SDG classifier works well, perhaps with some limitations due to both an imperfect training set and second, a conservative search approach resulting in some false negatives in the final results.
But we are currently addressing this and for the second generation of the theater to be launched late this year, Q4, we have relaxed the search and expect additional results, especially for SDGs 2, Zero Hunger, 9, Industry and Innovation, 14, Life Below Water, and 15, Life Above Water, Land. It's very clear from our statistical modeling that open access SDG research has a very strong wider societal impact, something which was also confirmed by the qualitative survey work of Workstream 3, as you will see from Hank's slides. I think an interesting follow up study might be to look at how academic content is picked up by policymakers and governments and how best that can be optimized. Goals with a low count included no poverty, zero hunger, gender equality, and life below water. On the open science side, my experience was that we did encounter more practical challenges than I had initially anticipated, but with some additional training and planning, we managed to overcome most of them. The partnership was a huge success. Above all, it showed me that when publishers and libraries join forces, a lot can be achieved. Looking ahead, the topic of societal impact continues to be of high interest for all parties, but especially VSNU, as early this year, they launched together with the main funders in the Netherlands, a new national strategy evaluation protocol, SEP, which gives societal relevance and open science more weight in the evaluation process than ever before. And finally, one of the best highlights of this project was the pleasure to work with my honorable colleague, Mr. Hank van der Horgen, to whom I shall now hand over for the rest of Workstream 2 and Workstream number 3. Thank you again. Can you now stop sharing? Uh, okay. And I try to, okay, share my screen. Let's see. Is this, is this feasible for you? Do you see? Uh, you um, know, Hank, if you could go into presentation mode, um, it will increase the size for our audience. Okay, then stop sharing, then I took the wrong one, maybe. I mean, uh, full screen mode in your um, PowerPoint. I think this one, it should be. Is this Lovely. the correct one? Yep, very yep. good. Thank okay, you. thank you. Okay, uh, thank you Timon for the first part of this presentation and Martin for chairing this very interesting uh, session. And after Timon's presentation, uh, we already can conclude that open access publishing really matters because there is an enormous uptake of OA content by the audience. And looking at this table, it's more or less a summary of, of what Timon just already uh, mentioned that the average number of downloads of open access is substantially higher than from the subscription uh, based publications, uh, where the average downloads of hybrid open access articles is the highest. And that has most probably to do with the fact that the hybrid journals are more established and have more prestige than the full open access journals. Also, the uh, average old metric attention score is substantially higher for open access. So we also see there an advantage. And we have only one point of attention, and that re relates to the number of citations. And although the citation data are a bit skewed because a substantial number of publications didn't receive any citations up until now, we see here that the number of citations for open access publications is lagging behind. And I will come back to that reason for that in a later phase. I now want to dive into the uh, more practical side or the, the more qualitative side of, 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 of the audience. We saw that there is an uptake of open access, but where is the uptake coming from? And therefore, we used a, a user survey uh, among the readers of Spring of Nature content. That is the content uh, it's published on uh, nature.com, springer.com, and biomedcentral.com. And there we received from about 6,000 respondents uh, input. And we distinguished there three groups who use the research contents for different purposes. The largest groups 
is evidently the uh, core readers and that are the scientists. And there are two non-academic groups, the, what we call the HALO users that are pro, uh, re readers with professional interest, but are not conducting research themselves and dive, dive into that group some deeper. It's, it's for the half of them, it's uh, people who are working or active in the medical and uh, health organizations. Uh, some of them are also in the policy uh, organizations, uh, retired uh, academics as well. So it's uh, quite a mixture of, of, of professionals uh, that are uh, in this group. And the last group are the general readers who have mainly personal interests. Focusing on the access of open access docu of, of documents, uh, apparently open access documents are available for everyone. So we thought it would be wise to see how the accessibility of subscription content is uh, perceived. And there we see a roughly 50 to 50% 50 split of those who could access the content and who couldn't. And on the other hand, we also see that the Halo and general segment users had relatively more problems, 62%, in accessing subscription documents. So therefore, we can strongly conclude that the non-academic users benefit the most from open access publications. The motivations for reading. In the general segment, personal readers, reasons or a mixture of personal and professional interest dominates over 60% of the motivations. And for the core and halo group, they are primarily triggered by professional interest, almost 60%, as you can see. And one third said that professional and personal reasons motivated their reading. Diving a bit deeper into uh, those motivations, uh, we did some questioning what has been done with the information. And we see in this table, the most mentioned, although not exclusive reasons divided among the three user segments. And for the core readers, the, the scientists, obviously citing and referencing is the most mentioned options. Where reading, staying up to date, uh, sharing with others are the most mentioned reasons in the halo and general readers. And with this distinction, we also have a probably a, 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 a answer to the question why the citation score is lagging behind for open access reasons. This could be uh, motivated by the uh, motivations of the readers, especially the halo, the halo and general readers use the document less for citation and referencing than the core readers do. And this is an interesting uh, point uh, to take into account because for a further uptake of open science and open research, a change in recognition and rewards of open science is definitely necessary to motivate academics even more to publish in open access. And here, what uh, Timon also referred to, we have in the Netherlands, uh, the, the Association of Universities, uh, the VSNU, who acknowledge this also. And they have pointed out this as an explicit program to take action upon. And now I go to the third work stream, helping researchers maximizing their social impact. And therefore we started gaining input from on the one hand, a worldwide qualitative survey among more than 9,000 uh, respondents uh, took part. And the review of the outcome of that uh, survey for the Dutch situation by making an inventory, uh, inventory within the Dutch universities regarding uh, the key areas of support to facilitate the uh, impact generation, um, provide an overview of existing tools and resources that currently are used by researchers and developing a set of good practices on effective ways to optimize the dissemination impact and 
promotion of research. And we do this by bringing all the information together in a kind of a toolkit for young researchers to help them increase the knowledge and improve ways to achieve societal impact within where we see the Dutch research community as an example. Now, to dive a bit into the main results of the survey, uh, the most intriguing, of course, is one is that academic impact is still leading. 83% of the researchers said that that was still their main drive to publish, to, to engage their uh, colleagues in the field. But when talking about societal impact, you see that there are different stakeholders outside academia per discipline and researchers acknowledge various ways to increase societal impact. And in the end, in the, in the bottom, you see also that they that the researchers see open access publishing and social networking as the most effective ways to increase their impact of research. We also asked questions about the support and the attitude towards societal impact by researchers. And there we see that quite some researchers at least a quarter of them, didn't receive any risk support at all or didn't know where to go to for support on societal impact. And this is clearly a challenge for supporting units at universities and beyond. And hopefully the results of this partnership will help them uh, in setting up proper uh, support services to get societal impact in the next phase. Um, the importance of societal impact for researchers, we asked that as some kind of an open question in the survey, and it shows quite some variety picture of answers, as you see on the left hand of this slide. And the most interesting one that I want to highlight here is especially that the younger researchers feel more a moral responsibility towards societal impact. And for support staff, it's best to focus first on this target group. That seems to me obviously. All the results of the survey are covered and made available via infographics, of which you see here two examples. The whole collection of infographics represents uh, the global researcher's attitude towards societal impact for research done in every SDG area. And it's shown at the partner website of which the link will be shown on the last slide of this presentation. Now, some information about the Dutch situation. We focused here on what the kind of impact support that is actually available. And here you see an overview that shows the support available at Dutch universities and the different organizations within these universities. And you can browse through all the via facets, through all the various types of information. And this has been already very helpful, not only for the researchers, but also for supporting units at, at universities to get inspired by, the, by uh, the way how their colleagues already have been uh, supporting and, and they took over some good ideas from them. Uh, in addition, we interviewed senior researchers spread among different uh, disciplines at uh, two universities in the Netherlands, at the Free University and at the University of Maastricht, about their experiences with creating societal impact. And the results are being made available via a blog post, as you can see here, a screenshot of, and also via uh, the partnership websites. And parts of it are also available in the toolkit that is now available. Beside the case study interviews, we also organize workshops with young researchers about societal impact of their research and how to improve it. And all this information, all this uh, the re results that I just talked about is made available via the societal impact toolkit. It's on the right bottom corner 
a screenshot of it. And this toolkit will help, uh, especially the young and new researchers to understand how other researchers view societal impact and how they have uh, been successful in creating it. Uh, there is full, full uh, of there's plenty of advice and insights from researchers' interviews, as well as further reading resources to help researchers find out more about societal impact as such, and how to increase it and create societal impact for your own research. To end with, also some lessons learned and takeaways messages from my side. Um, open access publishing really matters, not only for the non-academics, but also for the core readers, as we saw that almost 50% of the scientists experience problems in accessing uh, subscription materials as well. Policy attention is needed for societal recognition, for a further uptake of open access publishing and an increase in societal impact. Young researchers can be seen as the go, the, the, the target group to go for related to their moral responsibility that they uh, have in their, yeah, in, 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 in their body to maximize societal impact. And support on possibilities of societal impact is definitely needed. Looking at awareness, possibilities, tools, services, and maybe also some skills training. And last but not least, in addition to also what Timon said, a collaboration between a commercial partner, pub publisher and academia was in this case very fruitful and productive and uh, with a lot of engagement and full commitment from both partners. With this, I want to end uh, our presentation. Here you see the link to the partnerships um, webpage. And we are looking forward to answer the questions at the end of uh, the other presentations as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Hank. Thank you, Timon. Um, excuse me a moment, I have to do my own screen sharing now. Right. Thank you both. Um, that was really um, a fascinating talk and the toolkit looks like a really significant, rich uh, resource. And I think we'll all look forward to having a look at that in more depth later on. Um, so thanks again and uh, congratulations again on your well-deserved award from the leader organizers as well. Um, I'll move it along then. So coming up next, uh, we have a speed talk and our presenter is Josh Vesterbaker from Erasmus University uh, in Rotterdam. And he is going to talk to us um, at speed about best practice in online library access and privacy. So Josh, um, over to you. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Um... Sharing my screen now. So here we are. Hello, all of you. I'm scheduled in between two open access presentations. So you might think open access and authentication. What about authentication when everything seems to be open? The answer, open access doesn't stop authentication. So here's my talk about authentication at the websites of publishers. Authentication by means of institutional single sign-on. We can, we, we call that uh, federated identity management. So here's a lightning talk about identities and privacy. Let's start with a typical library's principle. All people should be able and free to do research. The principle of freedom of research. To support this, we need preservation of privacy. Sometimes for licensing reasons, one has to 
authenticate on a website. Who are you? The publisher then knows you are allowed to do this or that, or you just may log into the website to take advantage of personalization features. For obvious privacy reasons, this raises concerns by librarians. As librarians, we see an increasing demand for authentication. Publishers tend to move away from IP-based authentication towards personal authentication based on federated single sign-on. And whenever you are authenticated on a publisher's platform, also open access articles are consulted within your logged in session. So we should be aware of privacy. Many publishers offer federated authentication, sometimes called Shibboleth or Open Athens, when you face the login screen on a website, like you see on the screen here, the first uh, left side. A more common term is access through your institution, which is proposed as a standard by seamlessaccess.org. When you click on that, you can find your institution's single sign-on to login. You see that here on the slide on the, on the right side, number two. To protect users' privacy, libraries need to know how it works, and they should be able to provide a safe research journey online. The library has to safeguard the identities of its users. At least a librarian needs to know how to conduct research in a privacy preserving way. What can we do? Technically, we can configure federated authentication in such a way that it can happen anonymously. And practically, libraries should advertise a common library policy to publishers on how to configure federated authentication in a privacy preserving way so that publishers know what we want. This is what FIM4L is working on. FIM4L, Federated Identity Management for Libraries, is a group consisting of great knowledgeable people from libraries and the Federated Identity Management community worldwide. It has created a policy document with the name Federated Access to Online Resources, Principles and Recommendations for Library Services. The recommendations aim to reach the highest privacy levels while not hindering user friendliness and functionality. And this is published on the website fim4l.org and can be used as a reference to help you whenever you have to set up federated single sign-on with a publisher. The recommendations are endorsed already by LIBER, the Canadian Association of Research Libraries, the Council of Australian University Librarians, and the Research Libraries in the UK. And whenever you have questions on configuring federated authentication, FIM4L is there to help you. Contact details are to be found at the website. So this is the idea of the best practice. If you are going to set up single sign-on, let the publisher know to comply with FIM4L principles and recommendations. For publishers, it shouldn't be difficult to agree on all principles. What you see here, here is inside the document, principle four, which is the main principle concerning the configuration of federated authentication. It describes how to set it up with respect to the privacy level. The library should let the publisher know 
that it wants to configure it according to principle 4A or 4B. A choice has to be made. Anonymous or pseudonymous. To safeguard users' privacy, the library needs to ask herself two questions. First one, technical. Does the website offer personalization? If so, then choose 4B, personalized access, which is based on a pseudonymous identifier, which is known by the library, but not by the publisher. Otherwise, you can choose for A, which is called here transitional access. This is based on a completely anonymous identifier. The other question is a contractual one. Do we need some additional lines about privacy in the contract? Like what kind of communication with the students is allowed when personal profile, profiles are in place, of course. So there are, there's a lot to say about all of this, of course. Please read the document for more information. It's found, you can find it on the website. So what to do when you have to set up single sign-on? Go to fin4l.org and use the document with your negoti negotiations with the publishers. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. <clears throat> Excuse me for coughing. <clears throat> that was very clear. Uh, just to reiterate, um, everybody, if you have any questions for Josh or any of our um, speakers today, please post them in the chat and we will take them at the end of the session or we'll take as many as we can. Um, Okay, thanks again, Josh. Um, now we have a final um, team speaking to us today. Excuse me one moment. Uh, who are from the um, Museum for Natchikunda Billing. Um, um, and our speakers are Elisa Herman, Stephanie Pash, and Jana Rumler. And they're going to talk to us about open access challenges for smaller research libraries. Uh, Jana, Elisa, Stephanie, I don't know who's up first, so I shall just say that the floor is all yours and uh, let you uh, sort yourselves out. So thank you very much and over to you. Thank you, Martin. Um, I start my screen sharing. Yeah, well, thank you, Martin, for the introduction, and thank you to the LIBA organization team for giving us the opportunity to present um, the challenges that smaller research library like ours um, face when it comes to open access. Um, first of all, I would like to give you a short introduction on um, who we are. Um, then uh, Stephanie Pers will go on um, presenting the services that we're providing um, regarding open access and the along the research process. And um, as we are facing challenges or problems that we see, we thought that other institutions may have the same challenges. So we did a survey and Jana Rumler will present you the results um, at the end. Okay, so um, the Museum for Naturkunde is an integrated um, research museum and we're part of the Leibniz Association, which means we are an um, extramural research institution, so we're not connected to university, which I think has a big influence on how we're dealing with open access. Um, the central pillars of the museum are on the scientific research on one hand, where the um, research is mainly focused on zoology, paleontology, as well as geology and mineralogy. Um, we obviously have our collection um, that contains over 30 million objects. And the other thing, or well, the other pillar that the museum is very much engaged in is um, science communication and knowledge transfer. So we try to dismantle barriers that the general public may have when it comes to science. How does science work? Um, what are we researching on and so on. Our library um, was 
it's actually very close to, to the history of the museum. The museum as well as the libraries were founded in 1810. We did a lot of um, reorganization processes. <laughs> um, the first one in 1990, um, due to the reunification of Germany. And um, we were then still, well, then we were still part of the Humboldt University in Berlin and the library was part of the branch system. In 2009, the museum became um, a member of the Leibniz uh, Science Association which also means that the library couldn't be part of the library system of the Humboldt University anymore. And since then, we are, we are a standalone institution, so to say. In 2014, we had um, an internal reorganization as we are having right now again. And part of this is the so-called uh, Zukunftsplan. The Zukunftsplan is a project um, thanks to a large uh, big amount of foundation from the German government as well as the local government of Berlin, um, which we mainly use to uh, renew our building sites, but also to um, renew our research focus and to disclose and transform our collection. And the library is um, part of this process. Our vision is that um, at least some part of the library will become um, part of the knowledge center for nature that we are having um, in 2030 here um, in, in the center of Berlin, together with the Humboldt University at the new science campus. So currently we see ourselves as a special library, um, as well as a research library. Uh, we support the scientific communication, uh, public authorities, as well as the general interest of public um, along the entire research and creative process. And uh, we provide uh, scientific information infrastructure um, services and um, obviously also a personal expertise. Um, we have three main locations in the, uh, in, the, yeah, in the building, as well as 23 custodial libraries. So the library collections basically um, divided throughout the whole um, uh, site. There are five persons in our staff, which add up to four full-time equivalents. So we consider ourselves a rather small institution. And um, currently there are no service hours, but in normal times we have 35 service hours. And the fields of our action in the library is, um, despite information acquisition, digitization projects, um, it's especially the, the coordination or the services that the coordination office um, for scientific publishing um, offers. And with this, I would like to um, hand over to my colleague, Stephanie Pass. Okay. Stephanie, you should have. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's life. <laughs> Um, so um, now I would like to introduce our coordination office for scientific publishing um, as our example, how we structured and coordinate open access activities here at the museum. Um, since 2000, 2017, um, this position has been anchored at this museum. So the kickoff was uh, in this year. And um, one year later, we um, um, planned a survey just to help us to understand our users, so our colleagues and researchers at the museum, and so that we can adjust uh, services and yeah, just see the needs on um, services which can maybe our office could um, um, develop. Yeah. So we organized two big workshops also to develop our open access policy here at the museum. Uh, we had uh, a template from the Leibniz Association, which helped us uh, to, um, to uh, yeah, find our own policy at the end, but the spaces was very helpful. So uh, this was a very good tool just to create an, all, an own open access policy. And um, we, Secondly, achieved um, also um, a full membership uh, um, of the BHL Biodiversity Heritage Library uh, Committee, which digitized literature of the natural science and uh, offer support and training on that. Um, 
yeah. So another milestone on 2019 was that we had finalized our open access policy <laughs> um, and we participate in the German deal project with all its benefits, but also there are some obstacles. <laughs> um, and uh, 2020, we we evaluate our publication database and uh, we adjust our license management with LASER, that's an, in Germany a nationwide electronic research management system system um, uh, for libraries and consortia offices. Um, so it's a very useful tool to organize the e-resources and its contract content. And um, this year we um, reorganize our publication database so with new features for our users so that we gain a more powerful insight of the publication behavior of our um, um, yeah, researchers here at the museum. And uh, we also re-evaluate our open access policy. And we are currently waiting for the result of our proposal for open access costs, um, probably funded from the German Research Foundation. We, <laughs> we are just keen to, yeah, to it. So we will see how we can plan the next years um, for new services. Um, just um, I put some uh, publication links uh, on the slide too, just uh, to give you an, a more uh, funded or more more a deeper insight uh, on open science activities uh, from the museum and also uh, just another overview of our uh, scientific uh, publishing at the museum. So um, now I'd like to show you our open access services. I can't switch. Um, ah, yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, as I've mentioned already, we uh, do some training on data literacy. We uh, have some advisory service on open access publication funds. Um, we support uh, the access to information in general. Uh, we manage. Um, the publication database and also do uh, uh, more development on that so that we have uh, new functions for our users. And we um, offer training on open access topics and uh, we coordinate our open access journals of the museum. That's uh, Fossil Records, the Systematics Evolution and um, Deutsche Entomologische Zeitschrift, one of our oldest ones here at the museum. <laughs> Um, we observing and analyze alternative and open scholarly metrics, and we also give um, training on legal aspects with uh, third parties um, or, or external services on a basic level, because this is a very um, interesting but also complicated topic. Uh, <laughs> by using um, probably pictures or other th things when you do your research. Okay. Um, so why, oh, can I go back? Um, sorry. Sorry, um, why the survey at the end? So within this whole progress of building up our coordination office and also to build up services around open access publishing, we ask ourselves if other museum institutions have the same struggles and obstacles as we had um, during this years. And um, because through Germany, there are enough great initiatives and consulting services to implement first steps um, uh, concerning open access services. Um, but however, the implementation in one's own institution is a field of strength and often poses various challenges um, during the whole process. So this is the context in which we uh, develop the survey and um, we will give you a give, we'll give you a glimpse of this results in the following slides. So our main questions were, what are the biggest obstacles um, research library faces? What additional needs do museum libraries have in order to implement open access at their institution? And are there best practices that could be adopted at other institutions? But, but before we see the results, I just would like to, my, sorry, my laptop is very slow. <laughs> Ah, uh, 
Yes, I. Yeah, I just want to show you the definition <laughs> um, and which we um, used to analyze our um, um, data. Um, this definition is, I think, a good structured one. It's in, in original, it's in German, so I translate it just for the audience today here. So um, we clustered, uh, we decided museum libraries in this case are economic, special and personal related organizational component of a museum. It's, of course, a non-commercial purpose. Um, it has a, a significant stock of media um, and also the media is acquired close to thematic connections to the content and aims of the museum. It's in ideal way managed by permanently by a person <laughs> or by a person designed for this purpose in a part-time capacity. And uh, the library holdings serve scientific research and could also be a part of the museum collection, uh, what is also the case in our museum here in Berlin. So now I uh, just give you a short overview of our um, design. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, we clustered it in, in four parts. Thank you, Lisa. Um, <laughs> So the first one is uh, we just asked some general information to understand our participants uh, on the survey. Um, then we uh, asked questions about open access and their pub publication management. And then uh, we had a kind of, well, say, so to say self-evaluation. So we asked organizational framework, we asked for guidelines and uh, some advisory bodies where people can con um, contact um, uh, yeah, their, um, their um, advisory boards when they have questions on scientific publishing. And the second, uh, the last one is questions about open science. And um, you can <laughs> switch. So it's a lot of questions. So we put just um, a few uh, here for the presentation and Jana will show you some um dates and graphics so we have a short insight on the results of the data thank you very much Jana, you're on mute. You need to unmute. Hi guys. Is there is there a, a narrative accompanying these slides? Well, I guess I can just step in. Um, whoa, sorry. Hello. <laughs> oh, here I am, here I am. <laughs> here I am, sorry. Um, I couldn't unmute myself, the button was blocked. Okay. Oh, hello, Jan. Right. Hello. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Elisa and um, Stephanie. Um, can, you, can you switch to the first slide again, Elisa, maybe? Sorry, otherwise I'm... I'm switching okay um yeah uh, the question is first of all who were the participating institutions and where are they located so what you see here is a map uh, from germany uh, based on a wikipedia um, map and um and also um, below you see uh, swiss and austria and what you see is uh, that uh, 
only three out of 16 federal states of um, Germany, there was no feedback. We even had um, responses from Austria and Switzerland. So most of the participating institutions are publicly funded. Um, there are only a few private foundations, but also um, all of them are nonprofit. So altogether, we had a response of 29 fully answered and evaluable questionnaires. And there's a strong weightening to the humanities and social sciences. And the disciplines are in focus, um, arts and cultural studies, museology and archaeology. And uh, our discipline classification was based on the classification of uh, the Leibniz Association, uh, which is one of the four um, non-university research, research associations in Germany. Um, and also our museum is part of that. Um, so the survey was open and online for about two and a half uh, weeks from uh, this mid-May to uh, the beginning of the first, uh, the first week of June. And uh, we addressed around 300 uh, institutions in Germany, Austria and Switzerland, um, um, who are mainly organized in a working group called Museum Libraries in Germany and uh, German-speaking countries. So altogether, 9.5% uh, participation. And uh, so, but maybe okay for uh, explaining you today what happened with the survey. Okay, Elisa, can you switch to the next slide? Thank you. Okay, so here we come to some more general information. So most of the 29 museum libraries that answered had a team size under five persons. This was 95%. And uh, 41 of the answering institutions mentioned that there are a OPL, one person library, and why, while over the half of them consider themselves with a team size of under five, and uh, which is about 3.5 full time equivalents. So, um, as we said, uh, a, lots of them are one person uh, libraries um, and they cover the humanities and social sciences. So um, in the survey, we asked about the main concepts regarding the accessibility and research supporting of the libraries. And not surprisingly, uh, all are publicly accessible and consider themselves as reference library for the employees also. Um, half, half of the libraries also define themselves as library with own research topics. Just to mention in Germany or German speaking uh, regions, the library type special library uh, might have a different status uh, than in other countries. And our survey wanted to reach out to the special library type museum library. And what questions, uh, challenges and obstacles they face regarding open access and publication management is uh, now on the next slide, please, Elisa. Yeah, so uh, first we differ between two aspects, uh, aspects, the questions and the challenges and what can be seen uh, left and on the right, uh, you see the um, uh, the needs to address these uh, challenges and obstacles. Uh, just to shortly summarize us, um, it's a lack of three aspects, um, a human and a the human and the technical resources as well as the budget. So, but they are uh, they also declared to not have enough expertise in specific issues such as legal rights topics. However, another important aspect that was mentioned often was no expertise and or the management might be unwillingly uh, not involved. Uh, one comment was also quite critical uh, and obviously well engaged person with, uh, within the or a movement mentioned openly his or her uh, ambivalent perception of the in-house procedures and uh, requirements. Um, the person seemed uh, to support researchers offside the official, official communication channels. Um, this leads to the aspect of uh, strategic concerns that was mentioned, uh, which means uh, there's a strong focus on how to implement actual strategies with or without the management level. Or the other way around, uh, a higher level connection is implemented that scratches out uh, specific communication paths. Uh, another point that might be interesting is that within museum or library working groups, a lot of OA issues are addressed because in general they are not new. Um, but, um, sorry. 
um, but the uh, personal situations are completely different. Sorry, now I have to change my slides here. Okay, um, okay, and um, so and here, and not surprisingly, again. Um, the libraries want more stuff, they want additional budget and IT and prefer advanced training. Um, what leads us now uh, to the next slide, please. Yeah, okay. What you see here is again a chart, but we also wanted to give you an insight into the personal comments that people gave. Um, first, uh, the, to the chart, uh, we asked about the situation, um, uh, internal formalized recognition for a OA publishing, um, if there are work agreements and OA policies. Uh, to sum it up, what you see in gray colors is that there are less activities in these three aspects. Um, however, half of the 29 institutions that answered, um, they have or plan to have an open access policy. Uh, so let's take a view on the comments. Uh, by the way, uh, the codes uh, of the survey are available, of course, um, we just decided to shorten them here for proper visualization and better readability. So um, concerning, concerning working contracts, one answered, it was considered to anchor the obligations for OA in the new employment contracts, but this was rejected by the management because they did not want to create an Im imbalance to already existing contracts without an OA clause. So uh, the second comment was uh, it reacted on in-house restructuring. Um, the third comment is um, points out that there is an interlinking with the university activities they are um, connected with. And uh, maybe also interesting, the fourth comment says um, symbolic and effective uh, for the public is the signing of the Berlin Declaration. Um, however, on the other hand, there is no anchoring in working contracts um, and positive possibly very less in scientific parameters of science communication, um, like a funder oriented program budget plans and so on. This is something uh, our coordination office here at museum is working with. So um, most of the museum libraries have a curatorial approach, but as you can see here in comment six, it shows um, also can be event related. So, and um, to change the view to some more visual artwork, we would like now to show you some more best, uh, press, best practice projects by the uh, institutions that answered our survey and uh, supported the survey. So um, what did they mention as best practice uh, open access? We found three aspects. Um, they uh, name online platforms, uh, wonderful exhibition uh, catalogs and journal websites. Um, so what you see here, for example, is um, our two data portals from uh, the museum uh, für Naturkundes, so our museum, um, Museum of Natural History, and uh, das Deutsche Museum, the German Museum. So um, what you see here is that the data mass uh, in the museum is huge, um, for especially also in our collection, we mentioned 30, 30 million objects, um, but there's, uh, there are only few cutouts here in this big amount of this diverse collections. Uh, in the data portal of MFN, for example, you see here, um, uh, the uh, the uh, um, animal voice um, archive. And so our portal started at the beginning of this year as a first uh, digital insight to this very huge collections. So, and international data ag aggregators such as Europeana or BHL, they are mirrored back into uh, these portals, yeah? Um, okay, next slide, please. So as I mentioned, there are wonderful, really wonderful exhibition catalogs uh, that are seen as best practice open access. So what you see here right on the top of uh, the right side, um, it's a gallery um, art um, institution uh, from the city of Leipzig. And uh, what we sum up here is it's a scrolling experience. So if you click on the website, you um, see this wonderful colors here um, and you see videos and so on. So, um, and there's a bilingual or multi multilingual ex um, aspect in these exhibition catalogs. Um, 
and they are are addressing users um, but also citizens as well um, so but what seems to be still in progress is the way how to reuse the data that you this that you can see displayed here yeah uh, requests are still necessary creative comments or other licensing tools are not yet fully viewable and uh, you still have to request uh, the time with time delay although you see all these wonderful videos uh, pdfs and so on so um yeah, and on the other hand, um, quite they seem quite established are um, websites of journals, and um, what you see here is the uh, is an example with a university connection um, that shows uh, the editorial efforts on journal publishing with the technical integration um, into uh, institutional repositories, which uh, seemed uh, quite established now. So. This is from my side. Um, we are happy to hear about uh, your questions for our survey and I hand over to Elia again for a conclusion. Yeah, I think you can draw the conclusion very shortly. So um, as you heard, uh, the most challenges are the lack of, lack of expertise in the library. Often the library is not seen as the point of contact when it comes to open access. It's often the science communication department or public relations even. Um, we often lack the technical infrastructure. No, not every institution has an open access uh, repository, for example. And sometimes it's also lack of understanding when it comes to your uh, administration. Um, very helpful, like uh, is the um, uh, networks like Liber um, for, for uh, say, developed tools that we can reuse, um, offering trainings and workshops and also the guidelines and materials that we can use, although sometimes it's a bit, it's not specifically focused on the needs of, of small libraries. Um, and what needs to be done on a higher level is um, more clarification on how to handle legal rights in connection with uh, open access. We have a lot of obstacles right now with the deal projects in Germany, as you may have heard. Um, there also needs to be stronger discussions concerning open access and open science uh, within the local, regional and national political science management level as well. And um, yeah, so that was just a short um, conclusion. I'm very sorry. I'm very sorry for the, for the technical issues that never occurred when we tested it, obviously. And um, yeah. Thank you, and I'm really looking forward to your questions. Okay, thank you all. Um, uh, I must say you do quite a lot on four FTE. Um, so we 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 do have time for some questions now. Um, I have not yet noticed any questions appearing in the chat. Um, And as a colleague has just, uh, has just reminded us, if you do have any questions, then please do post them in the chat. Um, I think all our speakers are back with us now, uh, visible. <clears throat> I've got a couple of questions for, um, for the speakers uh, uh, while we wait to see if any of our attendees have any. I was interested in, in Yosha's um, uh, brief presentation there. Um, gosh, you, um, I think um, I think we know that publishers are perhaps understandably reluctant to implement changes on their side, unless uh, well, for particular sections of their of their market share. Um, and I was wondering if what you're working on is mainly European, or if there is some global aspect that that makes publisher take up more more likely realistic. I think you mentioned Europe and Australia. Um, have you got anywhere with anywhere in the rest of the world perhaps? Um, yes, I think it's more uh, global. Um, but what we see is that uh, uh, yeah, like to go to um, more personal uh, authentication. Uh, because the IP-based authentication um, is not uh, as uh, secure as they want. So I'm not really understand your question. I'm sorry, Martin, but can you explain what you mean? No, it probably means I've got the wrong end of the stick, Josh. I just feel uh, as if, if publishers have to do anything on their side. Yes, uh, pu publishers, it's, it's a very yeah, complicated 
restricted for publishers to um, to provide uh, federated authentication, um, but that um, that could be an issue for. But the the, the big big publishers all have uh, authent uh, federated authentication in place. All right, thank you very much for explaining that uh, to me <laughs> slowly. Um, a question has come in for Timon or Henk. Are the 9% of SDG related articles that you retrieved spread more or less equally? Or are we so Henk, I'm happy to attention? type that. Um, so first, thank you for the question. Um, it's a really good question. The, we did see an increase between 2010 and 2019. We got more articles from 2014, 15 onwards. And that is to do with when the SDGs were initially launched. So prior to that, they were called the millennia goals, but they did not come with the specified targets and indicators as they did from 2015 onwards. So naturally we did see an increase from 2015 onward, but since then the actual amounts of SDG classified articles per goal is pretty evenly spread amongst the goals from 2015 to 2021. Obviously national health and well-being got you know, phenomenal amounts this year. Um, I, I'm hoping that answers the question. Uh, it sounded as if it answered the question. Can I ask a, a, a related question, which I, I think I think in your presentation it said there was the the no form of OA in your analysis of the papers um, seemed to be quite high to me, and um, it was quite early on. I wondered if that level of non OA is falling. Are you seeing more open access? From 2015 onwards? Yes, we did. I'd, I'd have to look at the actual um, allocation of, of years, but my understanding is that the number of, especially hybrid open access, um, but also as well as gold, um, is growing incredibly fast since then. So every year there is more content being published in the open access format, whether that's gold or hybrid. Good, I'd hope so. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, thanks very much. I'll now um, refer your question to our museum's colleagues. Is there anything going on in um, research data management um, over in the museum's survey there? Um, well, speaking for our museum, we obviously do have a department for research data management. It's just not, um, the activity is not um, anchored in, in the library or the co coordination office. Uh, we used to be part of that department actually until the end of last year um, but uh, due to the new reorganization process um, the research data management um, is still its own department and we are now a department together with the archive and um, there are links but research data management is not part of our work but uh, just uh, to add, um, the question was also if uh, our um, answering institutions have uh, research data management. So um, we we were directly addressing also personally um, the libraries that are very traditional. And obviously also in other institutions, they have research data management uh, sections or departments, but not in the library themselves. So like uh, like for us at um, our museum. Okay, thanks. I, I thought that was an interesting question because the, the picture you painted where there are a few policies, no work agreements and a lack of uh, recognition and incentive around open access actually sounded like where larger research libraries were with research data management, maybe, you know, three or four years ago. Yeah, that's why I wanted to point out that obviously the special library type museum library works differently than other special libraries. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a comment from Henk in the in the in the chat, which has defeated me, I'm afraid, given my lack of um, Dutch. For sure. uh, so I wonder that, if you could help us out. That was that, that was just a response to Marielle who posed the question to Timon, and I thanked her, oh, her, got you, yeah. her for the question, and that she was still following us here uh, all the whole morning. So, <laughs> but I addressed okay. it to her, but also to all panelists. I now see. <laughs> so oh, I beg your pardon. I, I'm sorry. It, as as <laughs> pointed sorry. out, the, the attendees didn't see it. So that's just moving. Uh, okay. Go. Um, okay, I, I was, I think this was in Timon's part again. Um, 
The availability of academic research to policymakers and governments was one of the really strong drivers or, you know, in principle benefits for the whole open access movement. Um, and it was interesting to see that you might be researching take up in, in that, well, in, in those sectors. I wonder what you think the prospects are and whether you'll be doing this through a sort of survey approach or whether you think you can do it more programmatically. Um, so in terms of policy mentions, um, I mean, these are actually tracked by altmetric.com. So in theory, you could harvest um, some policy citations from altmetric.com. As uh, recently emerged, that was actually co-founded by Hugh and Aid, the founder of altmetric.com, and it's called Overton. And Overton is an advanced database that is really focusing on policy and uh, mentioned specifically also in many more languages. And I've, I've worked on a couple of projects uh, where we looked at the policy take up um, and we got some really great data points from there. Um, so it's not only the policy mentioned as well, but it's all the metadata that comes along with it that enables you then to sort the data by institution, by country, uh, by type of organization. So you can really get a feel for, you know, which regions are the policy mentions coming from, what kind of policy documents, um, and uh, what kinds of institutions, whether they're NGOs or they're think tanks or whatever. So I think um, I would be particularly interested to, to look at um, policy uh, mentions um, with Overton. Um, yeah. OK. Sounds promising. Um, Josh, I had a note to ask you if you're working with national negotiating bodies with your FIM4FL. Um, such as, you know, just collections in the UK? Uh, no, not, not, uh, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. <laughs> but yeah, we, we, we have, of course, uh, email lists, etc. And many of our, many, many um, uh, people are uh, uh, members of our uh, email list. So the news uh, will spread around and uh, you can join discussions. Everyone can join discussions on our email list of infra.org. That's very good to hear. Thank you. Um, I think we, we've got about 30 seconds, probably. I'll try and slip another one into Henk and Timon. Um, you, you, it was striking, actually, that your research shows that OA doesn't deliver as many citations as subscription um, yeah. articles. Uh, you mentioned that we need to do something around rewards and recognition. Um, if you have a very short answer in mind, I wonder if you have any specific <laughs> suggestions that research libraries might take away on that point. No, it, it, it's not a takeaway for the re, re, research libraries as such, but for the policymakers uh, that are in charge of that, that, that research mustn't be only uh, assessed by scientific impact, but also by societal impact, by the number of presentations that people will, will give, the number of, 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 of uh, attendance to maybe a uh, presentation in a municipality, for, for instance. There are all kinds of things that researchers can do to disseminate their outcome of their research to the non-academic world. And, and you see in the Netherlands, at least, that there are at uh, all universities now activities going on to, to get that more uh, body. And you know, uh, Timon uh, addressed the, the, the standard evaluation protocol that we have in the Netherlands to uh, assess research that has been now changed to a st strategy evaluation protocol, which means that, that, that it's not only the metrics that counts in that moment, but that you also uh, have to write or mainly have to write a narrative about the goals that you have set of your re research before and just talk about how are you achieving that and how are you achieving also the dissemination of the outcome to the outside world. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Is it possible for me message. to build on one point or Mark, before we go? Please be, please be super quick yeah, and do I mean, clear, yeah. Something else that we're looking at is, of course, experimenting with new formats um, to facilitate that process to communicate science and results to policymakers. So for Nature Energy, for example, we most recently launched a new format called Policy um, uh, Brief, 
which is a kind of a much shortened, um, more evidence-based um, format for the research. And we've done some surveys based on that, and, and that's been really highly welcomed, and, and it's really it's been very successful in helping researchers of those policy briefs to get their points across um, to, to, to policy makers. Um, so that's something that, that we're also looking into new formats to facilitate that communication and narrow that policy science divide. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. That sounds really interesting and, and novel. Um, we'd better wrap it up there. Um, thanks to all our speakers. I'm afraid you'll have to imagine a round of applause at this stage. Um, and thanks to all our attendees today, and especially for bearing with us through our um, initial technical challenges. There will be a LIBA evaluation survey, and LIBA would be very grateful if you'd um, completed <clears throat> and you will also receive a link to the recording um, of this session and copies of the slides so um thanks again to everyone speakers and um speakers and delegates and um enjoy the rest of the conference thank you very much goodbye thank you thank, thank, you. thank you bye thank you bye